you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh, Whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for me, for you, that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the Prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you in all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he, he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive a mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath, hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us, A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me. And because I go to the Father. They said, there, they said therefore, What is this that he saith, A little while? We cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, do ye inquire among yourselves of what I said, a little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me? Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye know, and ye now, therefore, have sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he shall give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name. I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. Again I leave the world, and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest not, no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest from, forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for the souls that got saved today and for this church and for the fellowship in it. We pray for uh, Tim that you just fill him with your Holy Spirit, that he'd be able to edify us from your chapter in John 16. In Jesus Christ, let me pray. Amen. All right, first I just want to say it's an, it's an honor to be able to preach here and to have this opportunity. Thank you, Pastor. And um, and just thinking back, because it's, it's been, you know, over a year since I've been, you know, since we've all been in this church, since we found this church. Thinking back to where we were, it's, it's just an honor to be able to be part of a church and be able to serve, you know, with the believers. And I uh, just wanted to kind of reflect on that a little bit. But looking in John chapter 16, um, this is... 
a passage. This is a chapter where Jesus is trying to give us some encouragement, and he does that in a number of different ways. He does that by first, you know, telling the disciples, this is kind of a sad moment, a moment of uncertainty in the disciples' lives right now. Jesus is about to go to the cross, and they're not quite sure how this is going to play out. They're not quite sure what's going to happen, but Jesus is trying to warn them. You know, he's been preaching for the last couple of chapters now, and he's about to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane as well. Um, but he's about to, he's telling them that he's about to go into the Father, and the disciples will have to endure some tribulation and endure some persecution because of the word. But also explain that he will send a comforter as, after he is gone. And the disciples are not quite understanding it at this point. They're, they're, you know, Jesus is talking to them plainly. Jesus has been talking to them and telling them what's going to happen very plainly. He's not speaking any Proverbs. He spoke unto like the Jews and the unbelievers in Proverbs. He spoke unto them because they weren't going to understand anyway. He spoke unto them in Proverbs um, and dark sayings and, and things that were not quite easy to be understood. And even the disciples had to ask him, you know, Master, can you interpret that for us? Can you, you know, break down that parable for us, right? Uh, parables and proverbs, but he's trying to tell them, and he's trying to give them comfort along with uh, telling them that the world is going to try to offend you, but he's going to send the comforter to us. So if you look at verse number one, he says, these things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. Now, he tells us these things, and he's telling us in preparation that we should not be offended. We, we think about the term being offended, right? A lot of people are offended these days, aren't they? A lot of people are offended at a lot of different things, right? People can be offended when, you know, when someone gets up and preaches the Bible and preaches, let's say, at the Lord and preaches against certain things. But um, we ought not be offended. What we ought to be offended at is not the same thing that the world is going to be offended at. So if we look at, let's turn to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. And we ought not be offended when God gives us a commandment of what to do either, right? We ought not be, you know, ashamed. The Bible says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, right? And so there's no reason for us to be ashamed. There's no reason for us to be offended or ashamed of the word of God. Um, Luke 7 and verse 22 then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he, watch this, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Blessed is he that shall not be offended in me. Why? Because he's giving them, he's giving them a commandment. Go your way and tell John. Go and tell what you've seen and heard. Go and tell that he's healing the blind and the lame and the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. He's healing everyone. And he's telling them, you know, basically we could take an application to this in, in the New Testament today and, um, and take that to our commandment of, being, of preaching the gospel. We ought not be offended. We ought not be ashamed by the world. Um, now the world is going to offend us in different ways. Um, let's see. A couple more things I want to show you. Go back to Luke chapter 4. We'll see what the world you know, can be offended by sometimes. <clears throat> Luke chapter 4, and also if you think of John, or if you think of uh, the city of Sodom in Genesis 19, right? If you think of, you know, the, the Sodomites that, that went up to the man's house and they, they tried to beat down his door, and he said, you know, it, he, he wasn't, lot, wasn't obviously um, very strong in standing up against the Sodomites, right? In his life we learned that. But um, he was... They could tell that he was righteous. He wasn't very righteous in himself, but then again, none of us are righteous in ourselves, are we? But um, they could tell that he was a man of God. He was he would believe God, and he was a righteous man in that sense. And so they said, this one fellow came into sojourn, and he must needs be a judge. They got offended when he just pushed back just a little, just the littlest bit, because he didn't give them everything that they were wanting to that they were wanting to get. So the world got offended because he just pushed back just even a little bit. How much more would they be offended if, you know, when the word of God is preached? Think about that. But if we look at Luke, Luke 4 and verse 28, um, we see before that. You know, Jesus is, is preaching in the synagogue. This is, I believe this is the first time that Jesus, you know, got up and publicly preached in the synagogues or the first recorded time in Scripture anyway. 
Um, but in verse 28 here, it says, And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they may cast him down headlong. They wanted to throw Jesus off of a cliff just because he got up and preached the things that they didn't want, that they didn't want to hear. The world was offended by this. They stopped their ears. They, they ran upon him, you know, screaming and just trying to throw him just in a blind rage, just throw him off of a cliff. That's how offended the world can get sometimes, can't they? And if we look also at Acts chapter 7, of course, the famous story of Stephen, who was martyred in the book of Acts, uh, we'll just look at the end of it here, verse 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. So they, stoned, they took up stones and they stoned this man. Why? Because he's preaching at them that, that they're the ones who killed the prophets, that they're the ones who killed the Son of God, and they didn't want to hear it. Well, there's believers out there today, and I believe there's true you know, believers in Christ out there today that would hear, you know, that, that may be, you know, have been out of church for years and years, and they may not be familiar with the things of God. They may hear something that's, um, they may hear something out of the Bible that they've never heard before, and it goes against what they've been ingrained to, to think and believe from the world's philosophy, right? Um, but we ought not be that Christian that's offended by the Word of God. We ought to be the opposite. Um, the world is offended by the word of God because the word, you know, think about it. The word of God is our weapon. The Bible many times likens the word of God unto a sword. The, the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing even to, to the uh, piercing the sunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The, the word of God is the most powerful weapon that's in existence today and certainly our weapon that we must use to, uh, to fight against false doctrines. So when that weapon is used, think about it. It's the word offend, you know, at its core, it means basically to attack, right? When, when we think about, and I'll get to in, in a minute, the things that do offend us today, the things that the devil tries to offend us with today, those are things that attack us. The devil's trying to attack us and bring us down, right? Well, the world is offended by the word of God because the word of God is our attack. See, when we go out and we, we don't necessarily get all doctrinally, you know, deep when we go out soul winning and when we go out, you know, preaching the gospel and everything, we, we go out there and we focus on Jesus Christ and him crucified, right? But when we start to tell them certain things and we start to debunk their false doctrine, if they're, if they're a follower of some, you know, false prophet out there, they're going to be a little bit offended if, if they identify themselves with, you know, someone like a Joyce Meyer or someone like a Joel Osteen or some, you know, um, big name false prophet that's easy to pick on, right? You take your pick. Um, if they're if they're associating with themselves, or if if they're you know maybe a Catholic that associates themselves with the Pope, like oh I have to you know follow the papal lineage of teaching and the apostolic lineage so called is passed down by the Catholic Church and so forth. Um, if they're identifying themselves with that, if they're a child of that. Uh, type of religion, or if they're a follower of that type of religion, they're going to be offended when they hear the truth of the Word of God. Likewise, the devil tries to offend us by um, throwing us certain attacks. And obviously, the, the Bible talks many, many times, um, many uh, great men of God were attacked by the devil, and many of them stood through it as long as they were sticking with God the whole time. But if we go to Luke chapter 21... Luke 21, see what Jesus is preparing them for. Not only um, he's preparing them for tribulation in the sense that they're going to face persecution in their own lives, but obviously he's giving us holy scripture as well. He's trying to make sure that we're prepared for tribulation, that we're prepared for persecution in our lives. Luke 21 and, and uh, verse 12 Verse 12, excuse me, but before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Why? Because, because Christians are out there preaching the word. In the end times, the word of God will be preached 
you know, at, at a pace around the world like the world's never seen. And so that's why they're going to get persecution like, like we've never seen before. Verse 13, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. Uh, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth in wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. This, I believe, is um, the, the comfort. The the reason, part of the reason why the Comforter and the Holy Spirit, you know, exists in our lives. That the ministry that it has in our lives is to give us, you know, hope, to give us strength, and to give us courage, and to give us the words to say as well. Um, now, it's not necessarily a knockdown, drag out fight every time we go and preach the gospel to someone at the door. A lot of times, most times it's a pleasant encounter, or at least we try to make it a pleasant encounter, you know, unless we run into crazy people, right? Um, but we're, we're going, and we have, you know, if we've done the work beforehand, if, if we've been filled with the Holy Spirit to, um, to be able to preach, the, the Holy Ghost will give us the words to say. He'll give us the verses that pop into our minds. Um, he'll give us, as it says, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist, because there's no arguing against the word of God. You cannot deny what's clearly laid out in Scripture. Um, so these offenses, in, and also um, the physical tribulations as well, if we look quickly at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you know, the Apostle Paul, the Bible says he labored more abundantly than they all, and he suffered persecution, I believe, more abundantly than most of them as well. Uh, he suffered many great afflictions in his life. <clears throat> if we look at verses 25, in chapter 11, verses 25 through uh, 30 here. He says, Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils, of, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils by the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, Besides all those things that are without, that he just mentioned right in those, those last few verses, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. So, um, and we can read, you know, all down through history, even since the whole New Testament, the whole Bible was written, we can read all down through like books as like books like uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, and so on and so forth. We can, we can read many stories um, in the Bible and otherwise of of men of God being persecuted, and I believe you know these are here for our admonishment, not because every single one of us will suffer all these afflictions um, just by de facto of being a Christian, right? Um, that's going to come. It's going to come a day during the Great Tribulation when we will have to suffer through that. Um, he's being he's preparing us for that because he knows that there's some of us who are not necessarily going to face all these beatings and stonings and everything, just to encourage us that, that some others have had it worse before us, right? You know, when we think of people like the Apostle Paul, it it, it doesn't seem you know as bad to get get yelled at or get you know a door slammed in your face every once in a while, right? So we can take some encouragement from it. It's, it seems like a lot of dark things, but really, you know, when you read it trying to gain encouragement from it, there's a lot that you can find there. So that's the first thing that, uh, that pops out at me when I read John 16. Um, let's see, we read verse number one. Let's read verses two through four. Let's get back here. So he tells us in verse number one, these things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended, right? He says, They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. They will think, and this is, I, I believe this has been happening all throughout history, really. They think that they'll be doing God's service. We think about, you know, perhaps Muslims that, that are overseas over in the Middle East, 
Um, they have their own God. They have their own God, Allah, that they want to lie and tell to us that is the same God, but obviously we know it's not because they, they don't believe in uh, the Son of God. But they have their own God. They think that they're doing God's service by killing God's people. There's Christians that are being persecuted all around the world. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. They know not the Father. The same, he who, you know, if, if you don't have the Son, the same has not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Um, they don't have the Father. They, they don't believe in the same God. My, my God has a name. It's Jesus Christ, right? Um, and there's many other names for God in the Bible, obviously. But they have not known the Father. They, they have their own God. Uh, verse number four, but these things have I told you that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. So I find it interesting in verse four. He says, these things I said not unto you at the beginning. Why? Because I was with you. He said, you know, there's a reason why he didn't tell them all of these revelations of things that were about to come in the end times and the tribulation and everything and so forth when they first met him. Because when they first met Jesus Christ, he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He said, you know, drop everything that you have, leave everything, forsake everything and follow me, right? That was what they needed to hear at that time. They needed to, you know, once they believed on Jesus Christ, once they believed who he was, then they had to, you know, receive commandments of him to, to go and work. They had to receive uh, commandments to go and, and preach the gospel. They had to learn how to preach the gospel, right? They had to learn how to serve. They had to learn how to be fishers of men and serve and preach the gospel um, and to serve as a church and, and to serve as a body of believers, right? Now that they're approaching the end of that ministry, they're basically at the end of this ministry right now, they need to be prepared to continue doing those works and they need to be prepared for continuing to work without Jesus Christ being with them physically in the flesh, right? This is what they need to hear at that time. So this is um, kind of an underlying theme, and I think it's interesting. We'll see it a little bit later in the chapter as well. When you look at chapters like this, and, and there's many other places you can, you can find the same concept in the Bible, is that God's word is revealed to people individually as they need to hear it. God's not going to give you everything all at once, right? Think of someone, like, like let's say someone who's maybe 25 or 30 or so and they get saved. Maybe they've been in church their whole life, but they, they haven't understood anything about the Bible. Um, or maybe even they haven't been in church. Maybe they don't really understand anything. Maybe they've not even learned anything about the Bible up until this point in their life. Then they get saved. Well, they have to grow little by little. They have to learn how to serve first. They have to learn how to do the first works. They have to learn, you know, it's great when they learn very quickly how to go soul winning, when they learn how to, you know, evangelize and, and tell people about Jesus Christ. And when they do the things daily that will help them grow in the Word of God, um, but it comes little by little. It's not, they're not going to know everything about in-depth Bible prophecy at, at, you know, three months after they got saved. It's just not, you know, not necessarily going to happen. They have to grow and they have to learn these doctrines and build, um, build on a foundation, line upon line, precept upon precept, right? So God is going to give us his word um, as he sees fit according to our spiritual condition is what I believe. Now, we'll be seeing this a little bit later in the chapter, but if you think of... Um, if you turn to, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, right? If we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, as we're turning there, if you think about a prophet like Jeremiah, right? If you think about a prophet, you know, the many prophets of the Old Testament, but Jeremiah comes to mind first. You know, he preached unto Israel, he preached unto them, um, he preached unto them to repent and turn that God might be, um, that God may be merciful unto them. He preached that God still has mercy that he wants to give you. He says, you know, you're going and you're almost at the edge of a cliff, um, but don't, you know, you, you got to turn and repent and, and come the right way. That way you can, um, that way God can bestow all these blessings upon you. God wants to make sure that you prosper in the land. He wants to make sure that you're uh, prospering and everything. But it got to a certain point where it was too late, and they just needed to hear, okay, now it's time for destruction. This is how it's going to play out. And then after the captivity, I'm going to bring you back, and they, then they can hear all that at that time. They weren't ready to hear all that because they weren't at that point in their spiritual condition yet. Um, but if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 
verse one, and I, brethren, when I came and when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So Paul, in in obviously being you know, being a great servant of God, he he had a lot of doctrinal knowledge. Obviously, he wasn't going to come to them and tell them all these things about end times Bible prophecy. He wasn't going to tell them all these things about, you know, stuff that they don't even need to know. There's this really deep doctrine. He's going to come to them and preach them what they need to hear. He, they need to hear the gospel. They need to hear um, how to be saved. And at that point, once they receive the gospel, then they can learn those other things. And so if we look, at, if we look back at John 16... We're going to keep reading here, and we'll keep seeing, you know, that theme pop up a little bit as we go throughout the chapter. So if we look at uh, verse number five, Jesus says, But I go now, but now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you actually asketh me whither goest thou. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. <clears throat> Excuse me. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So he's telling them that he's going to, you know, he's trying to clarify unto them that he's about to go away. Um, and he's, he's recognizing that they're filled with sorrow, right? He says, sorrow has filled your heart. And he's trying to comfort them and tell them, nevertheless, I tell you the truth is expedient for you then I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, he will come unto you. You know, the Comforter, if, when Jesus goes away, he's not going to leave us comfortless. Jesus knows just as well as I do, because it says in the Bible, in, in my flesh there is no good thing, right? If I was left to fend for myself against the wiles of the devil, if I didn't have, you know, the Holy Spirit, if I didn't have the Word of God, if any of us didn't have those things, we would be left for dead. Basically, we, we would have no chance against the wiles of the devil. He would take us down every time. But he's telling us these things because he's telling them, he's telling them that, that it needs to happen, that he needs to go away, that he needs to be out of, you know, be taken out of this world and ascend back up to the Father until he comes back again. But he's telling them, hey, look, this tribulation needs to happen. This all needs to happen. It all needs to be fulfilled but I don't want you guys to suffer and, and go through it alone. He, he says, we want you, he, he says, I want you to know that you will have a comforter. You will have a fellow laborer working with you. Um, part of the Holy Ghost ministry in our lives is to, like I said, keep us going when tribulation arises. He, he keeps us fighting. He keeps us encouraged that we can, um, that we can keep continuing the battle. And he'll give us the wisdom to say, and also, um, if you think about it, the Holy Ghost has a ministry to the world as well, and he explains it further here. Um, the Holy Ghost ministry to the world at large is to reprove it of sin, as explained here. It says in verse 8, And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And so the Holy Spirit is our fellow labor. Whenever we pray, and um, ever since, you know, basically ever since I started going soul winning with these guys and, and uh, meeting Brother Jeff the first time and everything like that, I always, you know, one thing that always stuck with me was that you want to pray for the Holy Spirit, not only for the Holy Spirit to fill us with boldness to preach the gospel, but also for the Holy Spirit to be sent forth right. unto the people that we're about to talk to to work in their hearts, that they might receive the gospel, to break up that stony ground, to break up that hard ground, that they can receive the gospel, that they can have that seed planted and have that seed watered and God can give the increase. We need the Holy Spirit to be working with us in that labor. If I was to go out, you know, if I didn't have the Holy Spirit with me, um, Let's say, you know, let's say I was to go out and I didn't have the Holy Spirit. I was just totally in the flesh. I was just in a bad mood. Everything, you know, it's all bad. Um, there's no way that I'm going to be able to lead someone to Christ. Why? Because I'm not in the Spirit. Um, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God because they're spiritually discerned. 
So we need the Holy Spirit to be working with us. And I think furthermore, it's our fellow laborer, which will reprove the unbeliever for the fact that they do not believe in Christ. Because if you think about it, when, when unsaved people, you know, if you think about the, the average unsaved person, their besetting sin is not that they're an axe murderer, is not that they're, you know, a serial killer or store robber or anything like that. Just the average un unsaved person, their besetting sin is the fact that they don't believe, right? The fact, you know, that's the number one thing that they need to get corrected in their life is that they don't believe. They need to change what they believe. They need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Holy Spirit, first and foremost, is going to work in their lives so that they can be uh, corrected on what they believe, that they can be corrected to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and receive that free gift of salvation. Then at that point, once they're a believer, then the Holy Spirit will be working with them as a believer to reprove them in the things they need to be reproved on. But... The Bible says in John 3, 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he is a totally horrible, awful sinner above everyone else. No, right? It says because he, is, he has not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's, that's the thing that the Holy Spirit is working with us to convict people, to, to, yeah, to um, reprove people of, to reprove the unbeliever. Um, I don't believe that an unsafe person necessarily has to be totally convicted and totally guilty about their sins. Um, it doesn't say because he wasn't guilty enough for his sins or he wasn't feeling horrible and weeping and awful uh, about his sins, but because they had not believed, right? So the sin of unbelief is really the besetting sin of the world today. Whenever we plant a seed with someone at the door, what I usually like to focus on, I focus on um, one verse that I, I usually like to use is um, 1 John 5.11, I believe it is. These things have I written unto you to believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. But if you plant a seed, I typically prefer to plant one that has the word believe in it. I, I typically prefer to you know, leave them with a the verse that tells them you know, th that's by belief. Something, you, know, you, you don't want to plant, necessarily plant a seed that's not going to give them the answer and point them toward the right direction. We want to point them toward um, believing the gospel. And so I, I usually try to plant a seed. If, they're, um, if, they're if they clearly state that they believe in something that's um, a works-based salvation, if they believe in like a false religion like Islam or something like that, uh, or Catholicism, we have to plant a seed that, that will show them that it's by belief. Then once they hear that seed, once they hear the word of God, um, it's up to them whether they want to receive it. And if, if that seed was received into, into a fairly good ground, then it may be that God will you know, allow it to be watered and, and then give the increase later on down the road. Um, but anyway, so the Holy Spirit is our fellow laborer when, when we go out and, and when we perform these works and these commandments that God, you know, that Jesus Christ has given us, right? Whenever we labor in God's harvest, I believe that we're... Um, we're laboring with the Holy Spirit. We ask the Holy Spirit to be sent forth and to be among us and to be sent forth to the people that we're about to talk to. So um, as we look further here in verse number 12, verse 12. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. And so we see here, you know, I, I think a minor thing we can touch on here is the the, um, the chain of command within the Godhead, so to speak, if you want to call it that. Um, we have obviously the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, it says here, the Holy Ghost will take of mine, that's Jesus. He'll take of what Jesus has and give it unto you, right? 
uh, just like he says in verse 15, Jesus says, all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. So it all comes down from the Father. And I believe one of the things here that is showing this is, is um, the Holy Spirit is what I would call a demonstration of our inheritance in Christ, part of our inheritance in Christ. What we inherit in Christ, obviously, is eternal life. And if we look, uh, let's look at, yeah, if we look at verse 15, Jesus says, all things that the Father hath are mine. Um, let's turn back a few chapters in John. Let's go to John chapter 8. If we look at John 8, verse 48, the Bible says, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I... No, that's not what I... <laughs> okay. I have a verse copied here. Um, it's apparently not John 8, 48. It says, Jesus said unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. If we look at John chapter... Yeah, John chapter 12 and verse 49 is another example. John twelve forty nine. The Bible says, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And flip over one page over to John 14.10. If we look at that, we see Jesus says, Believest, not thou, believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. And so inheritance, this is a whole other sermon in and of itself. I believe it's very deep, our inheritance in Christ. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and the rewards that we can get for serving Christ. But I believe that the first part of that that he wants to give us, the first part of the inheritance that he wants to give us is the word of God itself. He wants to reveal to us and he wants to show us the word of God through the Holy Spirit. He's going to take of mine, he's going to take of Jesus, Jesus Christ, you know, the word of God. He's going to take that and show it unto us. He's, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit, he's not going to speak of himself. Just as, just as Jesus said, I speak not of myself, but my Father, he doeth the works. Um, so Jesus has all things that the Father gave him, and he gives those to the Holy Spirit that we may, you know, continue to have them if we are filled with the Holy Spirit. So if you look back at our text here in John 16, let's go to verses 16, verse 16 here. It says, A little while and ye shall not see me, and again a little while and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us a little while, and ye shall not see me? And again a little while and ye shall, and ye shall see me, and because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, what is this that he saith a little while? We cannot tell what he saith. Now, with these disciples having been with Jesus for three and a half years, um, you figure that they, they would kind of know what he's saying by now. And with all the things that he told them in the previous two chapters as well, um, for some reason, they're still not able to tell what Jesus is saying. Maybe they're just a little bit nervous. Maybe they're just unsure. Maybe they just don't understand the death that he should die, right? Maybe they don't understand that he must be, you know, lifted up on the cross and they must, and he must be, you know, resurrected three days later. Um, but the fact of the matter is they're just, they're not quite picking up what he's laying down here, right? It says, you know, it says, it, show, it shows again here that there are always going to be some things that we may not understand at first, but if we keep listening to what the Spirit is trying to tell us, we'll eventually get it. This is what I get, you know, out of this passage here. 
um, if we keep listening, if we keep our ears open, if we keep, you know, keep studying these things, maybe it's something that we're not supposed to understand at this time. Maybe it is something that we're supposed to understand. And so we just need to dig a little bit deeper into it, right? But if we just keep listening um, and keep our minds open to what God has for us, then we're going to um, be able to, to get all these things here. Verse 19, now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do you inquire among yourselves that I said, A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me. Verily, verily, say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. So he gives us encouragement in the fact, he says, look, you know, the world is going to be rejoicing, and oftentimes, you know, the world and wicked, un ungodly people, they're going to be rejoicing when they see men of God, um, you know, cast down and killed. Um, and, and they rejoice and they mock and they laugh and they scorn when men of God, like the, like the story you brought up today, Pastor, about the, um, the man who went over to uh, Sentinel Island off the coast of India, I believe. He, he went there and he knew that this place, you know, that they're not even going to be receptive to hear if they can even understand English or if they can even understand you know, whatever spoken language um, that you're going to bring over to them. He just wants to go over there and make an attempt. He wants to go over there and bring them the gospel. All he knows is that you want to, um, you want to just go over there and give them a shot, right? So he knows what, what's about to happen. And, and Jesus is telling us, look, if you're, reading, if you're in the word of God, you ought to know what's about to come to you as far as tribulation and everything is concerned. But be of good cheer, but it says your sorrow shall be turned unto joy. If he goes there and he, he makes a genuine attempt to go and preach the gospel to that nation, um, or if, if, you go, if you go somewhere that's maybe not as receptive and you take, you know, take whatever kind of um, harassment that, that they might throw at you, if you're, if you're um, sure that you're going to get kicked out of this apartment complex or whatever happens you know, to us here in America with our light affliction, right? Um, if we do all these, those things and we know what's coming to us, it's a greater resurrection, amen. It's something that Christ wants to show us. Look, just go and do the job knowing that you'll be suffering these things, but you're not alone. He says you, you have the Holy Spirit with you. Um, it says your, jo your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Aren't you glad that Christ has you know, a better resurrection for us when we go and, and we do these things that he tells us to? Uh, verse 21 a woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. So when we go and we win people to Christ and we come back rejoicing, bringing our sheaves with us, it's worth, you know, a little bit of mocking maybe from family members at Thanksgiving. It's worth maybe a little bit of, you know, oh, you, you go door knocking with your church. It's worth a little bit of maybe a little scornful, you know. Um, maybe th there's a one family member who's always scornful towards the things of God. Maybe there's always one, you know, maybe there's some awkward situations in our family where they, they don't want to talk to us about the things of God or this or that. But... It's all worth it in, in the end when we bring our sheaves with us. And so, uh, continuing on here, verse 23, it says, In that day you shall ask me nothing. When Jesus comes back, when, when, we, when we go through all this persecution and tribulation, when we you know, see him, when we're gathered together with him in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, there's not going to be anything that we need at that time. You know, we're we're going to get the inheritance that we have uh, right. that... Christ has for us. He's going to be giving us um, our inheritance at that time. It says, In that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. It says, Hitherto ye have asked me nothing, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. Look, we ought, if we're serving God earnestly, we, we ought not be afraid to pray for those things. We ought not be afraid to have, you know, a good prayer life and be asking God to be, number one, filled with the Holy Spirit and, and to have, you know, blessings in our lives, to have healings in our lives. We, we ought not be afraid. We know God is a great physician, not only in a physical sense, obviously, a spiritual sense as well. He's going to be able to heal our broken conditions. He's going to be able to heal um, 
uh, heal and, and work in our lives, that we can you know fix things in our lives. He's going to be able to give us these, these things. So we ought not be afraid to ask, you know, to ask Jesus for these things because he knows that we're going to put it towards winning even more souls, toward, he, he's, towards building, you know, a church and doing even more work for God. We ought not be afraid to ask for these things when we have the right, you know, the right vision for our lives to be servants for God, right? So he says, you know, don't be afraid. Um, Hitherto you have asked me nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive. He says, these things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day, uh, in that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go into the Father. And so he's trying to make it even more plain unto them. You know, he says in, in that day later on, um, once all these things come to pass, right, we're going to understand, we're, we're going to have a much clearer understanding of all these things. We're, gonna, we're no longer going to be seeing through a glass darkly as we are now. We're, we're no longer going to have uncertainty and doubt. If we think ahead to the tribulation and to the, you know, to the end times, we may not really, in fact, we, none of us can say how exactly it's all going to play out. But uh, we have the comfort that these tribulations are going to happen to us. Um, but if we, you know, at, at that time, we're going to be able to see these things plainly. Right now, it's a proverb unto us. He's just trying to tell them as plainly as he can right now that, you know, these things must all come to pass. I came forth from the Father, and I'm coming to the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. And it says, his disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. I think they got the message at this point. He's not going to be with them very much longer, right? Verse 30, now are we sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. So at this point, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they got the message as best that they, that they can right now, right? I think that at this point they're pretty much prepared to, you know, as prepared as they can be to go ahead and, and keep preaching the word of God, to take those things that they've learned, that, they, that they've experienced over the ministry with Jesus and, and all the time they traveled and walked about on foot from town to town all over the regions of Galilee um, and all over the place. They, they've been with Jesus and they've been, um, they've been working with him. They've been laboring with him. They're like, okay, um, I know that you're no longer going to be here, but we're ready to go ahead and keep the torch going and keep, uh, keep the works going and preach, preach the gospel to the whole world. Uh, of course, after Christ is resurrected, he's going to give them the great commission to go and preach the gospel to all nations, go and teach all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, um, teaching them to conserve all things, to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Um, and he says, and lo, am I with you all? I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So he gives us, you know, when he gives us the great commission, he gives us that comfort again that we can, you know, go and do the work and he's always going to be with us. Um, but I think they're ready, you know, at this time to go and keep those works going. In verse 31 here, it says, Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So we ought to be of good cheer. Whenever we, you know, whenever we think of these things, whenever we think of um, maybe some brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, even today across the country, you know, or recently across the country in Arizona, our brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, being thrown in jail for preaching the gospel, um, for preaching in the wrong neighborhood or preaching, you know, in the wrong name or whatever have you. Um, when we think about these things, we ought to 
be reminded that Jesus has overcome the world. Jesus has already won the victory for us. He's already given us the tools to accomplish a victory. He's already won that victory for us. It's, it's ours to go and take it. It's ours for the taking, right? And so I hope this was a blessing to you. Let's uh, close in a word of prayer. Brother Jeff, would you please pray for us?